Hello, my name is Javier Llamas, and I'm a professor of history uh, from Bakers College, and I will be discussing a single de Mayo, you know, uh, for CCB, HRC, the Historical Research Center. So I want to thank them for reaching out to me. Uh, but the origins of Cinco de Mayo, you know, uh, for many has different uh, uh, has a different background. You know, many just think it's some people think it's actually Mexican Independence Day. Obviously, that's incorrect. Uh, some people think it's just a day of celebration for the culture. You know, that's obviously incorrect. There's a whole historical background to this. And I will be referencing uh, many historians who've written on this topic and, of course, throw in some of my stuff. Uh, but the origins goes back to, you know, the California uh, Silicon Valley area, the South Bay, San Jose area. And this is the place where, where it was known as the New Almaden Mines. But if uh, one of the reasons that this place is very important is because this is the origins of the first uh, Latino wage workers, industrial workers. Many of these people uh, uh, were uh, veterans of the gold rush when it first happened in 48 and 49 after the U.S. takeover of the Mexican-American War. And many of these groups came from, uh, uh, from uh, mining backgrounds, whether the Chileans, Peruvians, Mexicans from Sonora, and of course some Californians. So these, they, all had this, uh, they all had this mining background, so they were the more successful in the first years. After 49, Obviously, most people heard of the 49ers. That year is when the world arrives, the next year. And there was a lot of animosity, a lot of racism and stuff like that, mainly because this group was the, one of the first, so they were the most successful at first dibs. And so eventually they get, they get pushed out. Uh, but they remained in the area, and many ended up working in, this, uh, in these mines, so the Nuorma then being one of them, in where they would extract mercury from the ground in order to be used to separate the gold from the ore, the quartz, you know, that kind of stuff. Because now mining is getting harder and harder. At first it was very easy because, you know, le it was less people. But by now, by 50s, by mid-50s, late 50s, uh, it's obviously getting harder and harder to, to mine. So these workers are there. And like I said, the importance is the first Latino wage workers, uh, Chileans and Peruvians, many people forget those two. Uh, but the connection with the language is what kind of got them together. Um, eventually you have uh, the Civil War that emerged in the U.S., and California becomes very, very important to this because California, because of its geographic location, does not participate directly in, as far as battles is concerned, even though they did send soldiers, but they were mostly important because of the gold that they were sending. Anyway, through San Francisco, through the Bay Area, uh, gold is coming out, silver is coming out of Nevada, being shipped out through San Francisco. So California became very, very important, and the South understood this. The South, the Confederacy knew that that they thought they could defeat them early, but once the, the Union is lasting much longer than they expected, you know, they, they realize that part of their longevity is based on the money that's coming out of California, that's keeping them afloat, if you will. Uh, so there was two known attacks that I am familiar with for about, or, or potential attacks by the South against California. One is a direct uh, foot soldiers into California from the, I believe, the second Texas. And what they do is they move west out of El Paso on their way to California, but they are stopped at Glorieta Pass in New Mexico by uh, Union soldiers from Colorado and California. They were just patrolling the region. Coincidence right there. Uh, but anyway, they were stopped there. Eventually, the supply lines are, are overstretched and they return. Another uh, attack uh, was through the seas. The CSS Shenandoah somehow broke the, the uh, U.S. Navy blockade, was hiding in England, once they get their uh, orders, instead of going around South America, you know, uh, they didn't want to risk being spotted by uh, the ships coming back from the East Coast to the West Coast uh, because they were being escorted because of the gold. They, they opted to go around the world the other way. So they went through uh, uh, South Africa, through the Indian Ocean, uh, through the Pacific. By the time they arrived, the world was over. So th that was too long thing. So we know that the South had California on its, on its radar. We have to be able to stop that gold. Uh, and so many people will think, well, what does Cinco de Mayo have to do with this? Well, according to David Hes Batista in his book, uh, uh, El Cinco de Mayo, an American Tradition, the U.S., uh, this battle has a lot of binational implications because with, the, with the, the Confederacy moving into California in Mexico in 1860s, we have this, uh, there is a three-nation approach to Mexico to collect debts. I'm talking about England, Spain, and France. But all they want to do is collect their debts by blockading the port of Veracruz, which is the most important port at the time. What happens here is that France or uh, uh, England and Spain realize that France has a more ulterior motive. They want to regain some colonies. 
And they're going to do this by trying to take over Mexico because they know it's a weaker country who just finished 20 years earlier uh, the Mexican-American War. So once Spain and, and England back out, France continues its, its push to control Mexico being stopped at Puebla on Cinco de Mayo. So when that happens, we know that, that the French eventually take over Mexico for, for a dictatorship for years under Maximilian. But at this battle, they were stopped and sent back. According to David Hayes Batista's, uh, Dr. Batista's work, with the Confederacy looking towards California and France being an ally of the South, you know, because obviously they're angry that the U.S. always chose England over them whenever there was uh, uh, international issues between those two countries, especially when France supported the U.S. in its revolution, so they were obviously very upset. Uh, uh, he argues in his, in his uh, research that Mexico would have been used as an attack into California because they couldn't, they couldn't cross the border, obviously. Uh, so so with, with Mexico not falling in the Battle of Puebla, this uh, uh, prevented the, the Confederate troops from using Mexico to attack. So this battle here, of course, unbeknownst to them at the time, now in retrospect, looking back, it, it was more important than people think, especially to the US. Uh, but going back to the battle happens, France is defeated, they ret retreat, uh, you know, being defeated by a, a very, very humble, very poor uh, soldiers, you know, many farmers with machetes, you know, not official soldiers under the leadership of General Saragossa. But nonetheless, once this battle is won by the Mexicans in Puebla, uh, you see newspapers from all over pr proclaiming the defeat of the French. Now, they ended up winning the war, like I said, but at this battle. And what it showed was it gave them hope. It gave them this, this uh, idea of, of, of that it could be done. So... Back to the Almaden mines, they hear this news out of the newspaper of San Francisco, specifically La Voz de Mexico, uh, the Mexican voice. And La Voz de Mexico proclaims the defeat of the French at the Battle of Puebla in Cinco de Mayo. So they throw a celebration. And with the celebration, they charge people to come in. And remember, we, they're talking about Chileans and Peruvians there too. It was not just Mexicans. Uh, so Chileans and Peruvians participated in this. And you, you have this celebration at, in San Jose, in Spanish town, in the New Almaden mines. And with the celebration, they have dances, they have uh, uh, barbecues. Of course, they have uh, like a beauty pageant kind of deal. And whoever raises the most money becomes the queen, that kind of stuff of the night. And so this is all meant to create, to generate funds. And these juntas patrióticas, these patriotic committees, are the ones responsible for doing this. And what they do is, once they collect money, they send it, the money to Mexico. Mind you, there's a civil war going on in the U.S., but yet these people are sending money to Mexico. Because two, they feel that this attack on Mexico is sort of almost an insult to the, basically their, their, their background because whether you're Chilean or Peruvian or Californian, you know, you see what's happening to you. You've been thrown off the mines. You've been, you know, pushed out, uh, whatever. And now there's another country moving into your homeland in Mexico, especially if you're Californian. Uh, so all this gave them this idea of we need to help. And this battle probably gave them that sense of it can't happen. So from there on out, in, from 1862 forward, the first anniversary, of course, is 63. And from there on out, every year on Cinco de Mayo, even though the French have now moved in and started slowly taking over the country, uh, every year the hope was to throw them out. And every year on Cinco de Mayo, they through the same celebration, the same uh, dances and parties and stuff like that, collect money and send them to Mexico. Eventually, once the mining operation ends, you know, uh, eventually by 1870, the U.S. or California has moved away from a mining to a more ag, you know, especially with the Miller Lux case uh, with water. You see this, uh, that many people leave the mines and start moving down to Southern California. Along with that was these Juntas Patrióticas. These Juntas Patrióticas started moving around the state and becoming, uh, growing, their, having their own centers, own celebrations. So it was spreading all over, the, all over California and into Arizona and Nevada and, and Oregon some places. Uh, so these Juntas Patrióticas, everywhere you went, there was one committee that created, that celebrated the Cinco de Mayo. And that's where we get their connection to uh, Kern County. Uh, Max Nunez arrived in Kern County in the 1880s. Uh, uh, the, his first appearance in the newspaper is around 1881. So he could have been here a couple years earlier, but that's when he appears in newspapers. But he is a descendant of the Almaden Mines. His father was a miner in the Almaden Mines, and he grew up in the San Jose area, this, uh, this place called Spanish Town. So he was familiar with this, uh, uh, with this uh, activity. So when he arrives to Kern County, he is one of the more proponents, one of the most important proponents of uh, the Cinco de Mayo celebration, of course, him being Mexican-American. 
Later, when we see more arrivals of more Mexican migrants, you see the, the push for September 16th. So you see that, not a rivalry, but you see the, who, the, who the people are depending on which celebration they choose. In this case, we're talking about Cinco de Mayo and Max Nunez. Uh, but also these Juntas Patrióticas, there was one here in Bakersfield that became the, the basis of the Mutualista Societies that continued to do these uh, celebrations. But also, uh, according to uh, research by Vicky Reese in her book, uh, From Out the Shadows, you see the larger cities having a women's uh, Juntas Patrióticas. Not just an auxiliary of the men's. I'm talking about a separate women's group. And of course, Vicky Reese uh, considered this very important to uh, the, mov the movement by women because remember, it was thus the name from out the shadows. They came out of it. So there's a lot of research on this topic. And um, that Cinco de Mayo, again, has a larger implication, not just a battle, not just a day for celebration. Again, according to David Hayes Batista, uh, Dr. Batista, uh, this Cinco de Mayo became an important point because they grew up with this yearly celebration. It became nostalgic by the time the turn of the century happened. And then you see a, a pride for the Chicano movement because this, this is an American holiday. It's not a Mexican holiday. So, and then of course now it's more commercialized. But nonetheless, this, this day, Cinco de Mayo, an American tradition, yet uh, uh, many people are not familiar of its origins. And that's hopefully what I discussed today. Thank you.